Welcome back to the final part of Land Law Freehold Covenants. And in this segment, we will consider how the burden will pass uh, in the context of covenants between freehold landowners. Now, in the previous segments, and indeed when we broke uh, from the last segment, we did consider how a subsequent assignee, for example, can get the benefit of the covenant. Well, even if you can get the benefit, in order for the covenant to be effective, the person seeking to enforce must not only get the benefit, but show that the person against whom he's seeking to enforce has the burden. Because if you can show that you get the benefit, but you can't show that the other party has the burden, then under the law, it is completely ineffective. Now then, how do you prove the running of the, ben of, of the burden at common law? Well, at common law, the burden of a covenant cannot run with the land. It's that simple. That is the short answer. If you come up against any exam question, is once you've explained to the examiner, for example, that X has the benefit, the question now is whether he can enforce against Y. You start off with Y by saying, unfortunately, in the case of Y, the common law does not allow for the running of the burden. However, and you carry on. So the starting point is that the burden of a covenant will not run at common law. The case for that, of course, is Osterbury and Oldham Corporation, which was affirmed in the 94 case of Ronan Stevens. Notwithstanding that, that is not to say that the common law is completely impotent because the common law may be able to allow you to avoid the rule depending on how you deal with your property. If, for example, you're the covenantee, there are a few ways in which um, this rule can be circumvented at common law. Now, we'll only consider the two main, way, main ways. There are others, but the two main ones are, of course, the rule in Halsell and Bristol and the operation of a chain of covenants. Now, the rule in Halsell and Bristol, a 1957 case, says that if there is a mutual benefit and a mutual burden, then arguably you may be able to pass the burden. So the so-called mutual benefit and burden rule. If it is that the assignee of the servient land has the benefit of a covenant, this should be coupled uh, with an obligation to contribute towards the cost. Now, Lord Denning considered in circumstances like that, a covenanter could not avoid the obligation to pay if he also had the benefit. An example of this is, for example, in practice, if we would look at, for example, something in relation to a covenant to repair a driveway, you have the benefit of the driveway, the right to drive over it in order to get to your property. So you should also have the responsibility of paying towards its upkeep and repair. Um, the point is that sometimes you get, for example, persons who own within a development and that development may have, for example, a maintenance fee. Now, everyone is a freehold owner. So the point is that the, the maintenance fee may be there for the beautification and, uh, of the place, the upkeep. That may very well be that the beautification is also to your benefit. So the, and the payment would arguably be a burden, but the mutual benefit and burden rule would kick in under the rule in Halsell and Brazil. Equally, second point, of course, is that there could, by an operation of a chain of covenants, be such that the common law would allow uh, the covenant, or, uh, the burden of the covenant at the common law, but by way of a uh, chain of covenants. Now, the chain of covenants work in similar fashion to a chain of indemnity. So, if B covenants with A to repair a fence and he then sells his land onto C, if C doesn't repair the fence, so he breaches the covenant, A can pursue B for breach of contract because he can pursue C in common law as the burden hasn't run. On the sale to C, however, 
B will have taken an indemnity covenant from C to the effect that if B is pursued by A for breach and damages are recovered, then under the indemnity covenant taken from C, B will be able to then sue C for recovery. Remember, the common law looks to uh, things far more tangible than equity does. Now, because the burden doesn't run at common law, then you have to consider proving the running of the burden in equity. And nine and a half times out of 10, in any discussion in free old covenants, and in particular, as it relates to the running of the burden, the bulk of your discussion in this regard will be about the running of the burden in equity. Well, as a starting point in the 19th century, the limitations of the common law to enforce covenants sort of prompted equity to intervene by means of an injunction, the equitable remedy. Now, equity stepped in in the case of Tulk and Moxie, which we've discussed before, and now restrictive covenants are proprietary interests in land, and now only restrictive covenants or freehold covenants may be enforced in equity. The burden may pass to a successor in title of the servient land, provided in both cases that certain preconditions are met. Now, we know that you can enforce as between the original parties. The position in equity is the same as that at the common law. You are the original covenantee, you are the original covenantor, so the original covenantee can sue the original covenantor in contract. Now, according to Tolkien Moxie, in order for the servient owner to be subject to the burden of the restrictive covenant in equity, certain factors must exist, and they are these. The covenant must be negative. Secondly, the covenant must accommodate the dominant land. Third, the assignee of the covenantor must have acquired the servient land subject to the burden of the covenant. The assignee of the covenanter, of course, must have acquired the servient land subject to the burden of the covenant is really what I will talk about. Now, the first two requirements tend to be uh, straightforward. Uh, and so what I will focus on here, of course, is that the assignee of the covenantor must have acquired the servient land subject to the burden. Now, if you're looking at unregistered land, you needed to have registered that covenant as a D2 land charge. If you're looking at registered land, it ought to have been registered as a notice under Section 34. Remember that a covenant is always an equitable interest. So it, in order for it to be protected, in order to bind a subsequent purchaser, you must protect it. Now, unregistered land covenants created after 1925 are capable of registration, and as such as I say, they must be registered under the Land Charges Act, and it is a Class D2 land charge. If it is not registered as a land charge, it will be void against a purchaser for money or money's worth. In registered land, in order to protect the burden of a restrictive covenant in registered land, the covenant team must enter a notice in the register of the Serbian tenement. If the covenant is not so protected, it will not bind a person taking a registrable disposition of the land for valuable consideration, meaning if somebody else buys the land, it will not be binding. It cannot be an overriding interest, so it doesn't fall within Schedule 3, for example, because we know what Schedule 3 covers. And Schedule 3 only really covers legal leases, persons' actual occupation, and of course, uh, easements. In Hodges and Jones, the court said that if it is not registered, then the assignee of the servient land will take free of the restrictive covenants. That said then, what are the remedies at common law? Well, if you're able to prove the benefit and burden of the covenant at common law, then the claimant may claim damages from the defendant. In equity, what are your remedies? Well, if you are able to prove the benefit and burden of the covenant at equity, then you would be entitled to ask for injunctive relief 
i.e. of the restrictive covenant. You, so restrictive covenant, again, meaning something negative. If you are required, uh, again, in equity to uh, seek uh, a remedy, specific performance, we are looking at positive covenants. Let me just pause here again and say this, that one of the requirements in equity is that it must be a negative covenant. Now, a negative covenant means that it must be restrictive insofar as it cannot be a positive thing. And remember, uh, I said this in leasehold covenants, but for those of course, those of you, of course, who have not seen the leasehold covenant lecture, the point is that even if the covenant is written Neg uh, negatively but has a positive effect it will be a positive covenant so if it is not to let the fence fall in disrepair will fall under a positive covenant certainly lastly you can always claim damages if you have so uh, uh, if damages are uh, a sufficient remedy that of course concludes the segment on burdens, but it also concludes the session on freehold covenants.